This is Real Sales Talk. Real sales advice from real sales practitioners. Giving you tips on how to dominate your sales quota are your co host Sean Mitchell and Phil Keen. This episode is brought to you by Convertist. We are incredibly excited to have partnered together with Convertist, which helps SaaS and services run managed outbound campaigns for teams looking to drive new pipeline opportunities. For teams targeting midsize and enterprise deals, Convertist integrates with CRMs like Salesforce to uncover actionable data in their sales processes, which enables them to find areas of improvement and double down on strategies that actually work. Benchmark the lead generation performance expected of a seasoned SDR and identify actionable areas of improvement in a sales process, all out of one place with Convertist. For teams looking to measure and enhance their performance of their sales funnel and architect a better revenue engine, cast an application to join the Convertist Slack group. It's at convertist.com slash slack. That's convertist, C-O-N-V-E-R-T-I-S-T dot com slash Slack, S-L-A-C-K. What is going on, Real Sales Talk family? We have Michelle Weinstein here with us today. Sean, traveling in the car. Oh, he's always doing business, doing a real estate thing. You guys know What's he's up? out there hustling. What's going on, Sean? So we're, we're going to try to keep him on mute a little bit, give, give her the background noise. because he, He's probably driving with the windows down, letting the hair flow a little bit. So uh, we'll, we'll get after it, though. It's amazing. The hair flowing. <laughs> Well, Michelle, thank you so much for coming to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah, absolutely. We're we're a pleasure pleasure to have you. So we, we started getting into a little bit, just talking through what you're good at. And I think there's a lot of things ex- that you're an expert at when it comes to sales. Um, but tell us, you're a practitioner and you're a true practitioner. Tell us your story because that was really interesting of how you got to where you are and, and how you got into sales. Okay. So hopefully my phone works the whole time. But basically, I... My whole career started back out of college, and when I was out of college, I was the financial analyst at a company called Moss Adams in Seattle. And I got so bored sitting in a cubicle, typing up spreadsheets. I would basically get financial statements from people, and they would give them to me, and I'd have to input them and input them. And so long story short, it was three years, but I stayed there because my parents told me it was a really good job. And that I would get, you know, I had my 401k, I had health insurance and that whole thing. And I said, you know what, this whole go to work at like eight in the morning and it was super dark in Seattle at the time and then go leave the office at three or four and it was still super dark was not my thing. So I started teaching fitness classes at 24 Hour Fitness. I worked, got a part-time job at Nordstrom. And really that was like the start of this sitting in a cubicle thing is not for Michelle. And from there, I was three years. I ended up quitting one day when I just got so sick of it and fed up. I couldn't handle it anymore. And I moved back to Arizona where I grew up and where I went to college in Tucson. And I was like, what job could I do that deals with numbers and that deals with uh, spreadsheets and that deals with people and everything else? And at the time, the mortgage industry was really, really good. Do you guys remember the good times then? <laughs> and I got, I got into the top 3% of the company. There was about 800 loan officers at the time. And I was doing really, really well. And after a few months, they offered me a management position out here in San Diego, which is where I live now. But I got to see the financial statements of the branch. And I was like, you know what, this journey isn't going to last very long. So while I was there, I got my real estate license on the side and I started studying for that. I fulfilled my year contract. The day I got to go, the day I went to go quit, they also had my last check. So they fired me on the same day. And I said, you know what, I'm really glad we're on the same page. So for about a year, year and a half, I did real estate and mortgages on my own. I worked from home. I was working for some old bosses that I had back in Arizona. I did some real estate transactions, but it just wasn't, it was like doing the same thing over and over again for me. And I wasn't super passionate about keeping that as my full-time career. So 
I said, okay, like what else could I do? And at, at the time I was still a bit larger than I am today. And I said, you know what? It's because I'm not eating right. And you guys know, right? You're hustling every day, you're working and to eat right and work out is sometimes a little bit difficult. So I was looking for what was a personal chef in a package. And there really wasn't anything that existed. In LA, there is a company called Sunfair. They still exist today, but they weren't delivering to San Diego. And so I was like, well, what am I going to do? <laughs> you know, so I found this little company and I said, hey, you know what? I think I can do it better. I, he wasn't doing very well. I bought the list. I went and raised money. And fast forward, that was like the last 10 years of my life. And I had no idea what I was getting myself into. I mean, I was, if you guys think about it, let me just layer on the complexity. Like if you look at an onion and it's got all these layers around it. So in the core of it is we're changing people's lives to help them with their nutrition, you know, how you think, how you feel, how you look, all has to do with what you're eating and your exercise, right? So my mission was how can I help people change their lives one meal at a time? Well, I had no idea it was going to be so difficult. We were dealing with perishable food. We were dealing with um, manufacturing of food, suppliers, vendors. Your cost of goods on food is extremely high, okay? And I was like, oh my gosh, I'm actually getting into the food manufacturing business. Here I'm thinking, I'm just going to have a, you know, a company where like personal chefs in a package. And you know what was also really difficult, you guys, was dealing with chefs. I am very left brain, very like analytical, semi-creative, not the most creative, but a chef is like an artist. So I was basically dealing with a bunch of artists, but at my last company, we were actually selling um, per, like nutrition labels, you know, like the meal had exact macros, certain amount of protein, carbs, fats, and everything. So if it didn't match the label, I mean, there were some times I go in the kitchen and like, the chefs or the cooks were just sprinkling on salt and pepper, like extra salt. I'm like, these are like low sodium meals. What the heck are we doing? But chefs want things to taste good. That's why when you guys go out to restaurants, everything tastes so great, right? <laughs> so anyway, that's what I've been doing the last 10 years. I, I tried everything on earth to make this company succeed. I did it on a low budget. A lot of companies now are raising anywhere from 5, 10, 20, 40, 60 million dollars. I didn't have that kind of money. Um, but I did raise a little over a million. I did go on Shark Tank. I pitched there. I got our products into Costco. I did an amazing test with the vitamin shop in New York and New Jersey. It was the best experience I've ever had. And, you know, in between there, there were a lot of other successes. It just didn't work out at the end of the day. So closed the company in March on March 27th. Actually, on my birthday, March 3rd, I got three phone calls, and that was the writing on the wall. Like this girl that was renting my kitchen part-time bailed on me through the night and didn't pay rent. I got a call from this other opportunity. We were creating a direct-to-consumer online business with a supplement, a really, really big supplement company. And they had an online fitness program. And I think they just didn't want to get into the food business. And then uh, there was one other phone call on my birthday. And I said, you know what? That's it. We can't continue. The investors didn't want to invest more money. And I want to teach entrepreneurs and everybody everything that I've known in the last 20 years so you guys can learn from my mistakes and not make those same mistakes. So I do it through Facebook Live Show, talking to awesome guys like you and through my podcast called Success Unfiltered. So talk about some of those mistakes that you think you made really early on that if you could have just overcome them earlier, that you would have been maybe set yourself up and accelerate a little bit faster. There are so many. I mean, probably the one with Fitzy Foods is you've got to hire the right team. And I definitely didn't have the right team. Like I knew what I was really good at, but with that company, there were so many things that I didn't even know. I mean, I don't know how to cook, right? I started this company because there were a lot of people like me that wanted prepared meals cooked. And obviously it, the, the industry has grown so much and you can see that this is in very, very high demand now, right? So that was number one. 
Number two is like operations, food operations and food manufacturing. That I never knew. So if I would have had some expert in the beginning that actually knew what they were doing, we would have probably been way ahead of the game. And then as you start to look, there was, some, there, there was something in your mind. So thinking back from being an analyst to, all right, I, I'm going to work at Nordstrom's. Like, what was the <laughs> thing in your mind where it clicked? You're like, I actually like being around people. Like, do you have a moment in time where that actually happened for you? You know, I am definitely not an introvert. I am a total extrovert, but I'm like, uh, I'm like in the, I'm 75% extrovert. I still do like doing a few things on my own or staying at home and working from home some days. That's still, I love doing that. But I would say, you know, at Moss Adams, when I was an analyst, I got really excited when I got invited to go to the client meetings. That was very fun for me. So I guess that was the time, but there wasn't really just a time. I just really love helping people. And even at Fitzy, there were so many people that I touched that I never, heard, I never knew. But when I got those emails or text messages or you know, I have, I save a folder of like all the good stuff. I don't know if you guys do that, but it really helps. And just keeping the folder of like all the good text messages you get, all of the people you help and just having that like brag folder or brag, whatever you want to call it. Like that's really what it is for me. It's how can I help more people? And so it didn't work out with Fitzy and helping people change their lives one meal at a time. So now I would like to help all of the people. And I think I'm amazing at sales and I'm amazing at enrolling people and sharing, like, if I believe in something like Lululemon, that's all I wear. I love Lululemon clothes. I mean, if Lululemon had an ambassador, they should choose me. But I'm not in the fitness space anymore, so they don't really, you know, I'm not, I'm not their fit. But when I love something and I stand behind it, you've got, you've got to believe in it so much. And once you do, other, people's, other people will start to latch on. What do you think, Michelle? Um makes your sales approach unique? What, why do you think that you've gotten so good at sales? You know, I think it, I think it's really a few things. You need to be confident and believe Well, first you have to have confidence in yourself. And I think a lot of the things that I do, everything from, you know, eating right, working out, all that stuff. Once you have confidence in yourself, that's like step one. But second of all, you've got to really believe in what you're doing and what you're offering. And I think a lot of times that people in sales, if you're working for a company or if you started your own company, like you have to believe in it so much that other people, they don't even, you're not, you don't even need to really sell anything. And that's what I love to teach is how do you sell without really having to sell and without being sleazy and without being pushy? I am professionally annoying and I think that really helps <laughs> me and I talk about that a lot. On how if you're really professionally annoying and you're, you've got a good follow-up plan, you know, you're way ahead of most people because a lot of people, the second they hear no or whatever, they're done. And that's your opportunity to jump on in and really make a sale or, you know, if you're dealing with competition. Un unpack the uh, professional annoyance a little bit more. <laughs> like what, what exactly do you do? Is there any particular steps or or tactics that you utilize to execute on that? There are. There's actually a lot to being professionally annoying. I mean, it's everything from like uh, one of my friends who I'm helping grow her company right now. There's some times where people don't show up to phone calls. Most salespeople will just like say, okay, well, they didn't show up. Well, that's not what we do. What we've implemented is we follow up. Hey, so sorry. You know, life happens. Life gets in the way. Why, if you're still interested, like, let's rebook your call and get back on the phone. And, and you have to just acknowledge people. We're all busy, right? Like, you're in your car right now. I mean, it's just everything. Life happens. And if you come from a place as from, hey, you know what? They just probably forgot. And give them a second chance. Give them a second chance. Because sometimes those second chances have converted into sales for us. That those people need you because what they're doing today in life actually isn't working for them. Does that make sense? So that would be the first one on the front end of things. Again, it, there's so many variations. Um, you know, I'll give you another example for people that I know I want to get on their podcast. I reach out once, I reach out again, and I reach out again until they tell me no. 
or until they tell me no, that sometimes means not right now. So I'm actually putting in the professionally annoying into practice right now, literally. There's people, there's probably about 30 people that just haven't responded. If you guys haven't responded, that means you're busy. Or maybe I wasn't at the top of the inbox when you were checking your emails. Okay, well, I need to move myself to the top. So I pop in your inbox again, and maybe that timing's good. And I think timing is a huge thing. Like, timing is everything. I think that's really interesting insight, uh, at least for me. Just because someone doesn't respond doesn't mean that they're not interested. And I think as... Yeah especially as an early sales professional, you can, because you're not confident in your approach or yourself, you can assume that a no response means no, but that's not always the case. And right. what you're saying, you're kind of validating that, that sometimes people just get busy. Sometimes they yes. don't see, they truly don't see it, or maybe sometimes they forget. And um, it just takes a, a, a little bit more follow up until you get a response. 1000%. I mean, and I can just use you guys as an example. If you didn't respond to me, I would have just sent another email. And then if you didn't respond to me, I would have just sent another email at a different time. So I am slightly strategic in it. You just can't like blindly do it. Uh, another example is someone on my podcast, he told me he would come for an interview when he moved out to San Diego. And he's been in San Diego for about a month, month and a half. And I've called and texted him probably like six or seven times now. He's obviously busy. He's busy with his fit, with his kids. He's busy with his family. There's a lot going on in life. So maybe it just, you know, life got in the way. And if I keep following up, when it's the right time, he'll respond. That's just how it is. And that's literally how I've gotten to where I've gotten today. It's exactly how I got on Shark Tank. Getting on Shark Tank was not easy. There were 30,000 people. I had to be one of 140 that they picked to get there at that season. Now the competition is probably even higher, but that was like season four. So that was five seasons ago. <laughs> so uh, this, I think it's really interesting. So, so now you do this professional annoyance thing. You get somebody to finally respond. I'm glad you guys like it. <laughs> I'm going to go with it. We're going to go with it. So you're preparing. So, so Shark Tank was a big pitch. Costco was a big pitch. Better World's probably a big pitch. I've had a lot of big what pitches. Was, right, how do you mentally prepare for it? What do you, what's your process to get ready for that pitch when you walk into something like a Shark Tank, which obviously there's some nerves there, or a Costco, which could be life-changing if it works out well? Uh, I mean, how do you prepare for that pitch and, and hopefully it goes successfully? Well, which one do you want to talk about first? Shark Tank? Let's sure, let's talk, talk about, about Shark Tank. Tank. We mentioned it a couple times. Okay. So we'll go back then. So I had just, I mean, I was in the early days of my company. Very, very early, right? And with Shark Tank, I was like, okay, how am I going to get these guys' attention? So I found all of the producers on Twitter, okay? Key number one, find the people that are running the show, the production on social media. And I started engaging with them. Then I applied online. And after I applied online, I also submitted a video. And I never went to one of those open casting calls. I guess they do those now, but I didn't do that part. And I actually got a response. I was like, holy moly. I don't know if we can use bad words here, but I was like, oh my God, I got a uh, I got a response. I was in shock. So I immediately responded to her. We got on the phone. She said, I think you're a great fit. Let's go to the next step. I sent a thank you. So all the time, another hint is send thank yous. Like for every guest I have on my podcast, I send a handwritten thank you card. Okay. That old school stuff that no one does anymore, that stuff still works. And it actually stands out more now than it ever has before because no one does any of that stuff. So anyway, I send thank yous and I got on and they said, okay, you're one of like 140. But just to get to that point, I mean, you had like meetings with producers every single week. You were practicing your pitch. And I found here in San Diego, a new friend of mine now, her name's Cheryl Roush. She has a company called Sparkle Presentations. And we literally did practice pitches every single week. So my current investors were sharks. She was like my pitch coach on what do we, what do you do with your hands? Like, how do you, you know, I mean, all the practice that had to get into my brain so deep because when I was there and actually pitched, my legs were shaking uncontrollably. Like the stuff you can't stop. It's like your heartbeat, but your legs are shaking 
And it took about a minute probably for that to actually stop because I was like, oh my God, like, what am I going to do? And um, it doesn't matter how much I practice. I think it was just like to get to that point took so long. Um, so when I got invited up to do my pitch, they got, they do your hair, they do your makeup. You sit in these like waiting rooms and I was sitting there and sitting there and sitting there. And then after the full day is over, I got sent home back to San Diego because they're union people. And when you're a union, you can't, like they work eight hours and that's it. So if someone's pitch prior to me took a while, then, you know, sorry. Everyone who flew in from around the country is coming first. And then anyone local, San Diego, LA, you guys got sent home. So I got sent home. Came back a couple months. And every time you leave, they say, you know what? There's no guarantee we're going to give you a call back. You just don't know until you see yourself air if this process is ever going to happen. So imagine like there's no motivation. There's no encouragement. It's like, hey, if you get called back, then you'll get on. So, I mean, every week I was emailing the producers, keeping in touch, like staying top in mind. And my professionally annoying was at its peak at this time because if I fell off their radar, then why would they try to get me back? They're, you know, they probably had 200 people to choose from. I wasn't that important. So you have to make yourself important. So that's another tip. So then I got back. They called me back. I was like, whew, okay. And in the interim, we kept practicing, practicing the pitch, practicing with Cheryl. I mean, I was so overly prepared. Um, that's, my episode actually never aired. So that's how the whole thing ends. So I go back up to LA, hair and makeup done again, sitting in the waiting room, got sent home. So I got sent home two times. The third time I actually got to pitch. I think I was the last one for the day. Imagine sitting in like a waiting room, nothing fancy, practicing, practicing, hair and makeup. Like I can't tell you what's more nerve wracking than sitting there all day. Then the guys before me got a deal. So they're all excited and my setup to <laughs> my setup just to do Fitzy Foods there was so crazy. I had to set everything up. I had to put all these meals there. We set up like a refrigerator, all these fake containers of food, the real food. And then I had to warm up the food for them to try it. Remember who's getting what because Mark had dietary restrictions. <laughs> he was gluten free. So I'm like, oh my God. I mean, imagine setting up all your own stuff before you have to go make a pitch. And this is like your one in a lifetime pitch. I do my pitch, my shakes, my legs are shaking uncontrollably. It was about an hour, maybe an hour and a half to the point where like afterwards I was kind of blacked out because you're so in the moment and I've practiced so long. It's probably like an Olympian preparing for the Olympics to run the 100 meter dash. And then it's done, right? Like that's what it was like, except my 100 meter dash lasted about an hour. I was wearing high heels and my feet started to hurt. That's how long it was. And um, it, was, it was an amazing experience, the best experience that probably set me up for all the future success I had, like getting vitamin shop, Costco, and a bunch of other things. Oh, hey. Hey, I'm back. <laughs> well, I'm here and you can see me. So, I um, so I, I want to I want to know a little bit more about the structure of of the Shark Tank pitch. Like, how long was it, and what were some of those things that you had to do uh, in order to make that dynamic or interesting? The Shark Tank pitch. Sorry, the Shark Tank pitch was about um, I don't know a minute, minute and a half. It was very short, and all of the producers helped with it too. So it was very practiced. And they made a lot of changes and I like threw a hot dog on the ground. I remember that. So <laughs> it was, uh, it was very interesting. So you had 60 seconds to do a pitch. I'm, I want to key into this because I think this is really interesting. 60 seconds. What were, what were some of those key elements that helped make your pitch dynamic or interesting? Like there's a lot you could say, but I'm sure you had to have a lot of restraint. So what were you doing? Uh, what were you doing with your body, your hands? You know, were you, you did you have some intentional things that you did in order to make yeah. that pitch dynamic? 
So I don't know if you can see me, but I had my hands like this at my waist a lot. And I tried to talk with both hands as much as possible, but not too much where it covered my face or ear because otherwise that was a distraction. So Cheryl Rouch taught me all of that. I mean, she's like one of the top 14 speakers of like Toastmasters or accredited speakers in the world. She's one of only 14 females. So I learned a lot from her. If it wasn't for her, I probably would not have even made it. <laughs> on that day, I would have been super lost. But because of the repetition, I had it down pretty good. Um, as far as like what to say, I mean, it took probably 12 weeks of, I would have to make practice videos and send them to the producers at Shark Tank and send them what I've been practicing every week. And then we'd change out words. So they have a lot to do with it. And, you know, I did the first run through. It was about a page on a Word document. And then the rest was just uh, what I thought would grab their attention and keep it interesting. So how do you, there's a lot that goes into this now. You're, you're talking, you're emailing producers regularly, you're doing videos, you're doing practice, you're doing all this prep. I mean, this is a bigger thing than most people if they went to a regular pitch, even if it's a really big uh, opportunity for themselves. Yeah. It, how do, how mean, do you? There's so much prep behind it. For just a minute because even like a year ago I pitched at Sam Adams for a pitch contest to win like 10 20 grand or so I don't even remember how much I mean just to practice with that I worked with one of my other girlfriends who does a lot of work with people that do TEDx talks and I mean we practiced and practiced and they went from city to city so I won the San Diego one and then we all went to Boston and pitched at Samuel Adams with the you know with their CEO there and it really, like, you just have to know, you have to do so much practice. I think it's like working out. I always use that analogy. If you want to get strong or lose weight at the gym, you need to do it consistently. You need to always be at the top of your game. If you're pitching your products everywhere, it's not any different. Like, it took so much practice. And I'm not a natural public speaker by any means. Obviously, my legs were still shaking after tons of practice. It's just, you're, you've, got, you've got to actually work harder at the things that you're not very good at. How do, you, how do you manage the other side of your business? So as you're an entrepreneur, you're a salesperson, and you're going through these big life-changing pitches, <laughs> how do you not let everything else fall off so your business fails? That was hard. I mean, my business did fail. <laughs> you know, I, I think having a really good co-founder would have probably helped me or having a really good partner in the front lines with me would have helped because it was hard to do everything. I mean, I was the HR department. I was the CEO. I was the fundraiser. I was the pitcher. I Not like baseball pitcher, but like raising money pitcher. And you always had to constantly raise money. But if I looked at my competition, they all of them that are very successful today had like a founder and a co-founder, a lot of them. And I think depending on how big you want to grow your company or depending on what you're selling or whatever it is you're doing, sometimes having a really good co-founder can actually help you. Yes, you could hurt you, but it, I don't know. I mean, it got so big that it was hard to manage at all. I could probably start an HR company now because I got so good at HR because of all of the problems I had with employees, you know, and I, now I've even coached some businesses on what to do just on the employee side because my whole thing is how can you focus on what you're really good at grow your sales and also help your bottom line your net income well guess what when you're dealing with employee crap and going to labor court and hiring hr attorneys that stuff sucks the money out of your bank account very very quickly i dealt with probably between employee issues and lawsuits five big ones in the last 10 years that put us out you know, like that kind of stuff literally will put you out of business. And I ha I wrote this ebook. It's on my website at thepitchqueen.com about the 10 things that you should know before you either start a business or think about starting your own business that will not only help you skyrocket your sales, but it will save you $2 million because that's what it would have saved me if I would have known those things. Taking away what you got from the Shark Tank and now advising other companies I'm really curious to know what you learned from that experience at Shark Tank and how you're passing that along to 
the companies that you're advising. In particular, I'm, I'm really curious to know, do, do you recommend or do you teach to rehearse and rehearse and rehearse? What are your thoughts yeah. on that? I, I think you have to rehearse. I mean, I'll give you an example. Even to work on my sales today, I have a couple of accountability partners where we role play. Even today, or if I've got a big opportunity, I'll work with someone at my level to practice. What am I going to say? Run me through everything you think they're going to tell me on the other side. So I'm prepared and I have an answer for however it's going to go. I'll give you an example. From my Coffee is for Closers Facebook Live show, I got an email from a guy. Hey, I think you're awesome. I love your style. I think I want you to train a team. I'm their CEO coach or something. I said, okay, I need to rehearse every question that I think he might ask me, which is no different than Shark Tank, right? You guys want to, I'm, I'm borderline crazy. Well, all women are crazy because my, my friend Monique's a comedian. She <laughs> says all women are crazy. But here's what I did. I made a spreadsheet of every single pitch that was done season one through three on Shark Tank. And I analyzed every single deal. So I, I knew every question that got asked. I knew every single deal. I knew every single one that supposedly closed or didn't. And I had a whole spreadsheet of all the questions and answers. So I had a question and answer from season one to three for what I was going to say if they asked me that question. Make sense? I do that same thing today. So if Sean, when I talk to him, that's the guy that emailed me from my Coffee is for Closers, says, hey, this is what I'm looking for, you know, I've got questions for you. Great. Ask me your questions. I've already pre-thought what he might ask me, so I'm sort of prepared. If you don't prepare, you will fail, right? Isn't there a quote like that, you guys? Like, if you yeah. fail to plan, yeah. you will plan to fail. Yeah, uh, that's true. I'm fascinated by this, and, and this has kind of been a topic of mine since I went to this real estate conference a couple of weeks ago. But this idea of, because because there was this this uh, former Navy SEAL and and ultra marathon runner who says re rehearsing and practicing and training is key for success. So um, I really like the idea of storyboarding basically is what you're doing all the particular scenarios and responses and objections that you could get so that's going to be one of my takeaways for our conversation michelle um so you you do this do you do this for for every major uh, uh pitch or opportunity you you storyboard it out you get an excel spreadsheet and you you talk about or think do you also rehearse like how you respond verbally in front of a mirror do you videotape it what do you do um i i don't really do the mirror thing i like to actually get it out and talk to somebody and get some sort of feedback so i have a friend denise who i talk to regularly every week on things i have a friend dominique who we we bounce things back like she has a really really big call with a big company for um like a partnership deal for leads for her business and so we are going to rehearse a, what is she going to say to them? B, what are some of the objections she's going to hear? And C, what are we going to stick to our guns, right? Because sometimes some deals, you don't want to just, and I made this mistake way early on. You're like, oh yeah, okay, fine. I'll just do that. And you give in. When you give in, you're, you lost. And so we kind of know. So for example, with Sean, if he wants to hire the pitch queen, and my team to help train their staff, I have to A, know what's the minimum I'm going to do this for financially. Second of all, what's the hours I'm willing to commit? And C, like, are they in alignment with my values? Like, the, the team that I meet, I have to go and like interview the people that I'm going to be working with because I can't go help people if they're not coachable, if they're not going to be committed. If the, you know, there's all these things that I look for in people. So if they have the wrong team, I need to make Sean, make sure Sean's ready to get rid of them all. And we start from scratch. Or is this team going to listen to what we have to say? Does that make sense? So I need to know the values. I need to have the people I practice with. 
Um, I like instant feedback. Like I am all about dialogues, not monologues to myself and watching video. I mean, I can watch myself all day just going to replay my Facebook live shows, but it's not as fun. I rather get some really good feedback from people that I know are very good and have gotten successful deals themselves. I love it. I love it. That's going to be one of my great takeaways for um, this <laughs> this conversation with you, Michelle. So we're gonna we're gonna begin to wrap up, um, and we're gonna enter into a three question rapid fire where we kind of get into your head and learn about what makes Michelle tick. But before we do that, um, I, I want people who are listening to know how they can get in touch with you. So how can they connect with you? Where where do they go for your website again? And then if you're on social media, how can they connect with you? Yeah, I'm on all social media, so it's the Pitch Queen, T H E P I T C H Q U E E N, and the website's thepitchqueen.com. My Twitter is the Pitch Queen. My Facebook's the Pitch Queen. Instagram's the Pitch Queen. On LinkedIn, I am my name. Uh, I don't have the company up there, so it's Michelle Weinstein. Uh, but the best way is to go to the website, and then you can find all the stuff. And if you're on iTunes or SoundCloud or Google Play, you can listen to my podcast. It's called Success Unfiltered. And I interview a lot of people that I've met in the last 10 to 20 years of my life. Everyone from like Monique, who is the comedian, to top people like Garen Jones, who's like 1% in Herbalife. Okay, that's hard. Mm -hmm. It's amazing what he has done. So if you want to learn some skills, tune into Garen stuff. Or everyone from Kara K. I've done, I have interviewed a few real estate people, so that's been really cool. Some top producers here in San Diego, and it's very interesting to see all of the similarities. Also, female agent, NFL agent, talk about cutthroat. Interesting. Oh my gosh, yeah, it's very interesting. So we talk about being rejected, being told no, and the stages of the no's and the rejections that these people got. So it's actually very, very interesting. And then some also seven-figure entrepreneurs too. So everyone, I obviously know a lot of people in the food space. So like Justin from Justin's Peanut Butter is coming on, Pete from Pete's Paleo, uh, Jayla, a lot of post-Shark Tank vets too. Obviously, um, Shark Tank was very close to me and one of the best experience of, uh, experiences of my life. And a lot of the people that have been on Shark Tank some of it, you, you guys only see what's on TV. You don't see the behind the scenes. So they talk about the behind the scenes, which is really cool. So Tiffany awesome. is coming on the show from Ava the Elephant. She was like one of the first deals ever on Shark Tank. So Love it. That's, that's how great. you can find me, the pitch uh, queen. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Go check it out, everyone. Uh, all right. So we're going to move into some exclusive YouTube content. So if you're listening to the audio version of this, when you get a chance and get to your computer, uh, our Real Sales Talk page on YouTube and get the scoop on what makes Michelle Weinstein tick. So first question for you, Michelle, is how have your parents impacted or influenced who you are today? Oh my gosh, my parents. So my mom is from Moscow. She came to this country with two suitcases and $90. All I have learned. Thanks for listening to Real Sales Talk. And a big thank you to our sponsor, Convertist. If you enjoyed this episode, go write a review on iTunes or any other podcasting platform.